I think some of y'all know that my childhood was spent in a small town, Frederick, Oklahoma, and I've, I've always remembered a field trip that we took when I was in elementary school. We actually walked a couple of blocks away from the school to go visit the firehouse. Now, I, I thought of that this week because I was thinking about a, a story of a kindergarten class that actually went to visit a fire station. The first thing they did, of course, when they got there, they wanted to see the truck. Every child took a turn sitting in the driver's seat. They put on a helmet. They get out, and firemen have the hose, and they get to help the firemen hold the hose. It was a great thing. And then this fire station was one like in Frederick. After that, they went upstairs. And when they got upstairs, they got to see the galley where the firefighters prepared their meals. And then they saw the uh, bunks where the firefighters slept when they were on duty and waiting for those middle-of-the-night calls. And then they got to do what was probably the highlight of the day, slide down the pole. It was just a great experience. Once they got back down to the ground floor, then they had to uh, talk about fire safety. And so the fire chief was there, and he told them, he said, look, if, you know, if you ever get caught on fire, here's what you do, you... Stop, drop, and roll. Exactly. Some of y'all been on fire before. That's a good thing to know. All right. You stop, drop, and roll. And they said if you're ever in a house or you're in a building and it, uh, it catches on fire, if you go up to a door, you stop and you touch the door to see if it's hot, and then you get down on your knees. And he asked the students, do you know why you get down on your knees? And this little boy is about to come out of his skin because he knows the answer. He's raising his hand. Why, why do you fall to your knees? He goes, you have to fall to your knees and you pray that God will get you out of this mess. <laughs> okay, I'm not exactly sure that's what the fire chief was looking for, but as a pastor, I like the way he's thinking because we've been talking this year about prayer and how it is that we want to pray more as a church. Outside on the table is that calendar that we're asking people to commit to be a prayer minister for the day in praying for our church. And of course, last Sunday, we started a series on the Lord's Prayer. One of the things that I have observed as a Christian over the years is a reality of prayer in the lives of many people, and that is some people never really escape that childish kind of prayer. And what I mean by that is the only time they pray is when they're in a mess and they're asking God to get them out of it. And Jesus, in teaching people how to pray, wants us to get into a, a habit, a, a discipline, if you will. Jesus wants us to be people that regularly pray. Let's read again that portion from Matthew's gospel when Jesus is teaching about this. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room Close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. So last week, just to kind of review, 
we looked at what Jesus was hoping people would understand. And that is that there were many people around them that they had probably seen, that they probably knew. Many people probably in the crowd this day, Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, that pray the wrong way. The first prayer is what I called the hypocritical prayer. In other words, there were some Jews that loved to stand out on street corners. And while they're on the street corners, they, they love to pray loud and they love for everybody to hear them pray. And what they're doing is they're really not trying to engage God. What they're doing is they're trying to look good to people. They're trying to draw the approval and the applause of people. And, and, and some of us are, are guilty of that in ourselves sometimes. We're asked to lead a prayer. We want to make sure we get it right. We want to make sure that we do well. And so we may stress about this. It's a hypocritical way of praying. Now, brothers and sisters, can I confess this morning? Y'all okay with that? Sometimes I'm guilty of praying a hypocritical kind of prayer. I mean, I really hate to confess that to you, but if, if you're doing that, I want you to know we're in the same company. And sometimes I am guilty of praying with one eye on heaven and one eye to the people that are around. And let me tell you when that is. It's not on Sunday mornings when I pray. It's not when I pray before anything here at the church. It's when I get asked to pray in public, like at a a public gathering. Since, since I've been pastor here at St. Andrews, there have been a couple of occasions where I have been invited to go downtown and pray before city council meeting. And when I'm driving downtown, when I'm driving down there, here's what I'm thinking. Man, you got to bring your A game today. You, you, you got to do this right. And because the, the people that are there at that council meeting, they're not going to remember my name from Adam. They're going to remember the church I am from. If they're Southsiders and they say, from St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, the Southsider ears are going to pick up. Or if they're United Methodist and they hear United Methodist Church, man, people's ears are going to pick up. And my understanding is if I screw this up, I really make y'all look bad. Honestly, that, that's, when I'm driving down there, that's what I'm thinking. And, and, and I know I have to get past that. And I, I, I really find myself saying, God, when I'm in there, I want to pray for our city council. They are making decisions that somehow affect the lives of the people that live in our community. God, I want to talk to you on their behalf. If other people listen, fine. But sometimes I have to fight through all my own hypocrisy to get there. And the second kind of prayer that Jesus warns people about is what's called the pagan prayer. The pagans, the, the, the people that were not Jews, they were religious Gentiles that worshipped Greek and Roman mythological gods. And the Greeks and Romans had a lot of gods. And whenever they would pray, they used a lot of words because they never knew exactly which God was going to grant their request. And so Jesus says, don't pray like them. Don't pray with a lot of words. And when you think of the pagan prayer, I don't really even see it as prayer. You know what it sounds like to me? It sounds like a trial attorney making a closing argument in a case. If somehow I can convince just one member of the jury, the gods, to, so I get what I want, then I have accomplished what I've tried to do. And so Jesus is very clear. Before he's ever going to teach us how to pray, first he's going to address those issues for how we shouldn't pray. And in between those two things, there is a transitional statement that Jesus makes. There I say it is a transitional word. Just one word. One word. Four-letter word, a good four-letter word, but one four-letter word, a word that we probably use multiple times in the course of a day that really impacts the understanding of what we want to learn today. And that word that Jesus uses is when. When you pray. Not if you pray, when you pray. In other words, brothers and sisters, Jesus assumes that prayer is a mark of discipleship. He understands that he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount and there are going to be people, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, that suddenly are going to be attracted to him. They're going to love what he's teaching. They're going to begin to follow after him. And as they follow after him, when they pray, people will identify them as followers of Jesus because of the words they say. 
Remember, disciples of a rabbi would ask the rabbi, teach us how to pray because we want to be identified with you. Jesus knows this is going to happen. And so he is letting them know, he assumes, if you're going to follow after me, you are going to be someone who prays. If people are going to identify you with me, it will be because of what they hear you praying. You're not going to stand out on the street corner and shout it out, but if you're in the temple and someone just overhears you when you're praying, they will identify you with me. When you pray. (laughs) Now, friends, let's be honest. In all the tribes of Christian people that there are in the world, you can clearly identify some tribes by the way Christians pray. For example, if you see someone sitting quietly, clutching a rosary while they're praying, you are going to assume that they are Catholic. Now, we Protestants don't always understand the whole rosary thing, But we understand if someone's gripping one, most likely that person is Catholic. Or, if you've ever heard someone pray, I talked about this back in January, you hear somebody using the word Father repeatedly like a comma in a prayer. Father, we're just so glad, Father, that Father, we can all be here, and Father, we love you. I mean, we we hear people pray like that, and I'm not making fun of that. What I'm saying is we can identify the tribe, that most likely a person that prays that way comes from a very conservative, perhaps even fundamentalist kind of Christian background. How many of you have ever been to a Pentecostal or charismatic church when they pray. If you have not had this experience, I see that hand. That's what they do in those churches right there. If you've not been in that, let me tell you, there's a a, a phrase that they use that we use all the time, but they interpret it differently than we do. You know, in, in a Methodist church, if someone is leading and they say, let us pray, what do we all do? Bow our heads and wait for that person to pray. But if you go to a Pentecostal church or you go to a charismatic church, when they say, let us pray, that is exactly what they mean. Let us pray. Very interactive, very dialogical in what they say. It is group prayer. You can identify people sometimes by the way they pray. you, You know how you can identify a Methodist when we pray? It's silent prayer. <laughs> and Jesus knows that if you're going to be my disciple, a mark of your discipleship is when, not if, but when you pray. Now, beloved, that's not the only mark of our discipleship. There are several different marks of our discipleship. Let me just name a few that came to mind when I was preparing. One thing, if you go out on the street and you were to ask people, what is a mark, what is a characteristic, what is a sign that somebody you don't know might be a Christian? And I think that one of the things they would say is, you can tell a Christian because they go to church on Sunday. Now, what they mean by that is it is the habit of Christian people that we gather together for worship on Sunday mornings. See, you've already checked this one off your list today. You're really good. It's a sign that you're a follower of Christ because you're here. Another thing people would say is, well, Christians, uh, Christians read the Bible. And, 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 and they try to do what it says. I mean, we can understand reading, but some of that stuff in there, we're just not into. That's not what we want to do in our lives. We don't, but Christians, they, they read the Bible and they try to do what it says. Or maybe they see a sign of Christianity as our stewardship, our generosity that, that, that perhaps we tithe. Okay, now I'll, I'll just end there. So we've got four marks of a Christian. Worship, Bible knowledge and understanding, Stewardship and prayer. Now, let me share one thing that I understand that all four of those things have in common. Namely, that each one of those has a quantitative aspect to it. In other words, you can measure how often and how much of that a person does. 
You can measure how often a person goes to church. That's why we ask you to sign the red books. It's so we can keep a record when you sign in. We can, you know, we keep records on how much people give. We keep records on those type of things. It's measurable. And here's what I understand happens. Here's a connection I want to make on this. If we find ourselves suddenly needing to fall on our knees and pray, God, get me out of this mess. When we find ourselves getting in that mess, oftentimes what we do is we begin to ask ourselves how we're doing in those things that are measurable. You, you, you've heard people say, perhaps you've said yourself, you find yourself in a mess, and what's something that you hear? I should probably go to church more. Man, I, I, I should probably read my Bible more. I should have given more money. Friend, I'm going to tell you, and, and, and I don't in any way mean to boast in saying that those are not issues for me. And when we talk about going to church, I go most every day and three times on Sunday. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and the Bible, I, I try to read it cover to cover in the course of a year. That, that takes discipline. It's a habit. It's, it's not reading you want to get behind in. I, I, since I was a poor, broke college student, I tithe. I just believe that was important. It was a mark of discipleship. So it's never been an issue for me. But sometimes, <laughs> y'all told me I could confess this morning, right? Sometimes I find myself thinking, you should be praying more than you do. When life gets messy, and we begin to try to wage our discipleship, we can ask ourselves about those things that we measure. And I'm going to share something with you that some of you are going to be relieved to hear, and some of you might be confused to hear. But when I read the Gospels, I don't find that generally condemns his followers for not praying enough. I mean, yeah, there's that time in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus says, you shouldn't be uh, falling asleep. You should be praying. And there are times that Jesus says, you gave up. Don't give up. Keep praying. I understand those are things. But, but generally, Jesus does not condemn people for not praying enough. Now, here's the big question. If it is assumed that as a follower of Jesus, I am a person who prays, that it is a regular devotional habit that I have, if it is assumed that I will pray if I follow Jesus, but Jesus doesn't really condemn us if we don't do it much, then why should we pray? That's, does that make sense to y'all? Uh, some of, some of y'all got this figured out. Some of you, like I said, you're going to be confused by this. But if somebody asks you, why do you pray? Because bad stuff happens to you too. I mean, it, it, life happens, tragedy happens, death, sickness, all these bad things happen. And it doesn't matter how much we pray, it happens to everybody. So why should we pray? What difference does it make if we're not exempt from trouble in this world because we are people of prayer? Y'all want to know the answer? I mean, it's just my answer. It's because we must understand what prayer does. Prayer is that thing in our life where God begins to direct our lives. It's about directing ourselves to God. Richard Foster, in a book that he wrote that is titled Prayer, tells a story of a good friend of his. This friend had to go to the mall to do some shopping. Obviously, it was right before Christmas. That's the only time a man really feels comfortable doing that. He goes to the mall to go shopping, and he has to take his two-year-old son with him. His son is, on this particular day, the very definition of terrible twos. He's cantankerous. He's fussy. He's fuming. And nothing that dad can do to calm his son down is working. 
Whether it was out of frustration or desperation, his dad does something he's never done before. He reaches down in the stroller and he picks up his son and he holds him very tightly to his chest. And he begins to sing this impromptu song to his son. Now here's the thing. The dude could not sing. He could not sing. He, he's making up this song. The words don't rhyme. He's singing off key, which when you make up a song and you're singing off key, you're really bad. <laughs> but he just holds his, his son to his chest and he begins to sing whatever is coming to his mind. I'm so glad you're my boy. I love you. You make me happy. I love the way you laugh. And just over and over, he's singing whatever comes to mind. And guess what? It begins to work. His son, who wasn't really excited about that embrace, suddenly relaxes. He lays his head on his dad's chest and hears dad's heartbeat. They go from store to store, his dad just singing this impromptu love song. It must have been really funny to watch. But they get their shopping done, and his dad takes him out, and he puts him in the car seat. And when he puts his son in the car seat, his son looks at him and says, Sing it again, Daddy. Sing it again. Brothers and sisters, prayer is not a vaccine that immunizes us from getting in messes. That's not how prayer works. Prayer is when our heart speaks to God's heart and God's heart speaks to our heart. Prayer is about our hearts. It is about a love relationship that we have with God. And Jesus said, don't, 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 don't stand out on the street corner and, and do all that. And don't think you have to use a lot of words to convince me or to convince my father to do what you want. When you pray, go to this unseen, secret place. And there in that place, God already knows what you want. God already knows what you need. In that place, just share your heart with God. Your heart with his heart. And perhaps what you will experience is that God, no matter what you're going through, no matter what kind of fussy mood you're in, God will embrace you. And he will hold us close to his chest. We will feel the rhythm of his heart beating. And if we listen closely, we will hear him sing, I love you. I'm so glad you're mine. Whatever you've done, you're forgiven. Friends, I want to challenge you with two things this morning. The first is, as I looked at our calendar right before I came in to see about who has signed up for prayer minister of the day, we, we still have some openings. I want to encourage you, just make that commitment to pray for our church on that day. If someone's taken the day that you really want to pray, go ahead and just sign your name up to that. We can have two people, but we want at least one person praying for what God is doing in our midst every day. If you're not ready for that, again, I want to challenge you with the same challenge I gave you last week. That before you go to bed tonight, that you will... You will go to that unseen, secret place. It may take you 30 seconds. It may take you a while. But just get quiet. And let your heart speak to God. And let God speak to your heart. When, not if, you do that. What you discover is prayer is not about saying, God, will you get in line with me? 
Prayer is about saying, God, I want my life aligned with yours. Let's pray.